my talk's about uh, PHP's biggest bottleneck, which, which you can argue many, many things are PHP's biggest bottleneck, but for the sake of this talk, we're assuming it's my SQL. Um, so I'm Liam Wiltshire. Um, I've been working with PHP and Python and Perl for the last nine years or so. I'm the director of development at Absolute Design, which is awesome because it means I get to pick all the best and interesting projects for myself and give everything else to someone else. Um, I'm a fan of beer or wine, whiskey, kind of any alcohol really. Um, as I said, you know, I'm a director, but I'm still hands-on, particularly in terms of integrating third-party systems, kind of interesting sorts of problems, um, complex bills, that sort of thing. And if you ask me, I'm, I would say I'm an awesome leader and an absolutely fantastic facilitator. However, if you ask um, some of the guys on my team, then they'd probably tell you I'm this guy. <laughs> so, what's the problem with MySQL? Why, why am I um, you know, complaining about it today? The, the difficulty is that, you know, let's face it, we're developers. You know, we train as developers, we spend our time honing our craft um, you know, in PHP or other languages. Yeah, you know, we spend our spare time learning about new tools to add to our tool set, um, new frameworks, platforms, whatever that is, new development processes, whether it's you know TDD, DDD, whatever. And we don't spend time focusing on MySQL. We kind of know how it works, and you know we can build a DB and we get it to connect to PHP. And for a lot of developers, that's about it. Um, in most organisations, developers are expected to do MySQL by extension. Um, you know, if you're really lucky, you work in a large organization like a bank, then you might have one of these guys to call on. Um, if, I'm not sure how well you can read that. It says, I am a database administrator. To save time, let's just assume that I'm never wrong. Um, but the reality is, you probably don't. Um, so this isn't a talk about looking at complex setups that, you know, get the ultimate in my SQL performance. Those setups are perfectly valid and justified. You know, we're not talking about sharding. Uh, we're not talking about you know, really large you know, distributed setups, that sort of thing. Um, in a lot of instances, you know, there are lots of very simple ways you can improve your MySQL performance um, just by making very small changes that you could go and do in the next coffee break, to be perfectly honest, um, and they'd make a big difference. You know, the important thing is to benchmark. So not all the things I'm going to discuss will work in every situation. Some of them work great in certain applications. Some of them might actually make your application slower in certain instances. So measure first. Always, always measure first. Make the change on your staging box, your test platform, whatever. Then measure again. You know, if it's made an improvement, great. Push that into production. If it's not made an improvement, look at something else. Um, there are plenty of other ways, as I said. You know, hardware solutions, clustering, replication. But what we're looking for here are measurable gains through simple improvements. And hopefully, you can become, oh, where's he gone? Um, a DB Ninja, but the DB Ninja, there he is. DB Ninja. Um, it's a ninja holding a database, apparently. So the first thing we're going to look at, which hopefully you, know, you guys will all know about anyway, are indexes. Some people say it's indices, but it's not, it's indexes. Um, so. Most developers already have an idea about indexes. You know, we've all defined primary keys. We've probably all done some foreign relations, and we've added indexes to columns here and there. However, the way MySQL uses indexes is quite intricate, and without necessarily understanding how, how that works, they may not be as efficient as they could be. When at the most basic level, which you know, hopefully all you guys are doing them anyway, you can be, they can be used to improve the performance of anything that's doing filtering or sorting, so that's a where clause or an order. Um, and if that is something that you're not doing and all your DBs or all your DB tables have a primary key and that's it, you really should be adding indexes. <laughs> um, so I mean, here's a really, really simple example. For all of these tests, I've just set up some basic tables um, on this laptop. Um, it was kind of just a typical user table, so it has a, an email address, password, um, a user type ID and address ID, which then relate to other tables, and I populated it with 25,000 rows or so. So it's a really small example, but it is enough to show kind of some of the improvements you can make. Um, I wrote a really basic test script in PHP just to basically loop around 100 times, um, run the query, and take the timings, um, because doing it once is never a, you know accurate measure. Um, I did use MySQLi just because 
it was quick to set up last week. Um, so in this first instance, as I said, we're just running a simple query just based on selecting the email address. So that top one, I've got no indexes on the table at all. It is just a user table. And you can see, to grab a um, person with that, e that email address, just a made up email address, it was taking, you know, the minimum was 0.3, the max is 0.6, uh, 0.06, sorry, and the average again was 0.03. What you'll find with a lot of these things is actually the indexing, even if the speed increases aren't large, it makes the performance a lot more consistent. Um, in this instance, it does both. So the minimum has dropped down to 0.0006, and the maximum average again. So they've all dropped. So just by adding a simple, straightforward index on the email, email column, nothing more complicated than that, just a standard B-tree index, um, it's improved it by over 30%. So as I said, if you're not putting those indexes in place, you really should be. Um, but indexes um, in MySQL are a lot more complicated than that. Um, it's interesting to know what indexes should really be used for. So what indexes should be used for is to find groups of interesting rows rather than necessarily individual rows. Because it's fine if your index finds 50 individual rows, that's fine, but it still then has to do 50 independent file reads to go and get that data out of the database, which is still going to suck. Um, whereas if it can find a collection of rows that you know, could be the ones they're looking for and it can pull out just a chunk of 50 rows, it might do a bit of extra filtering on that if necessary, but the performance um, you'll get from that is a, is a lot more uh, impressive. Um, using indexes to avoid the need for temporary tables or file sorts. In a lot of instances, if you're um, doing queries where you've got, you're trying to sort on a column, if there's, no sort, uh, if there's no index on that sort, what it has to do is pull out all the rows it wants, so it's found 50 rows from that table, it then has to create a new table, a uh, temporary table, and put all those, those uh, rows back in it, and then it has to sort that, and obviously that's just a very inefficient way of doing things. Um, and equally, the ultimate thing is to actually try and satisfy entire queries without needing to use the table. If you've got what we call a covering index, so you've got an index that covers, let's say you want the email address and the name. Um, if you have an index that has email address and name, it can grab all the records it needs from that index and never actually has to read the full table at all. Uh, and obviously that's going to be a lot more consistent and a lot quicker, certainly if it's loading the indexes into memory than trying to read them off the file disk. So again, using the same basic table, uh, the same sorry, the same basic database table, uh, but with a few different queries, and we're looking at how an index can be used to improve the performance of a sort. So for this one, um, again, I've just put an index on the name column. I mean, the name was a 255 character varchar, I think. Um, and without an index, again, it's taking 0 0.05, 0 0.96 seconds, whatever. Um, when it's being able to use just the index, so it's not having to read the DB table at all, because we're only looking for the name column. Um, it's not having to look at the DB table, it's using just the index, it's doing the sort in the index, and it's just returning the results directly from the index. You're bringing it down to 0 0.02, and you see, again, the time is very, very consistent. There's, there's not much fluctuation in that time at all. It makes it you know, very, very reliable, very, very consistent on the time it takes. Um, again, here's another example. So this one, again, is using a covering index on name, email, and user level ID. Um, and again, the speed increases here aren't as big, but again, it's the consistency that we're interested in. So the, you know, if you look at the top one, the difference between the minimum and the maximum is 0 0.03, whereas in the next one down, you know, it's, half a, it's well, less than 0 0.005. Um, and you know, the individual speed, but if you're the one that gets the slow, slower query in the top instance, um, compared to getting the slower query in the bottom instance, that is going to make a measurable impact, certainly if you've got a site being used by 50,000 users. Covered, query, uh, covered indexes, like, oh, covered, sorry, covered queries, like I said, where the entire result can be pulled from an index, will produce faster and more consistent results, particularly when you are kind of using where's and sorts as well. Um, indexes are stored on disk um, when they're first created, but obviously for the best performance, you do want to store them in memory, so if you've got some memory to throw at MySQL, do. It can store, you, you can give memory to MySQL to use specifically for storing indexes, and you know, any index that's in memory is going to be much quicker to load than an index on disk. 
Um, keep indexes as small as possible, so use the right data types. You know, use an int versus a big int. Arguably, the difference is negligible, but again, if you're trying to scale this up and you're talking about thousands of users, ten, well, tens, hundreds of thousands of users, then it will make a difference. Um, and if you're using an index just for where's, think about how long you need your index to be. If you're looking up an email address and you're fairly confident that actually after the first six characters, each email address is probably going to be unique, there's no point indexing the whole 255 character email address if you can index the first six. You can't use that for sorting, so you know, do be aware of that. But for doing where lookups, often those first six, 10 characters, whatever, are enough. And it obviously means it's much easier to store that in memory. It's going to use less space. And everyone wins. The downside to using indexes, and this is that trade-off, is that they do create an additional load when you're doing writes. So if you've got a write-heavy application, um, something that's updating the database frequently, then actually the writing of the data back to the DB can then become the bottleneck if it's having to constantly update that index. So again, benchmark. If you know you've got a write-heavy um, application, you know, benchmark, you know, put, benchmark both reading and writing beforehand, then put your indexes in, and then, bench, well, and then test it again, benchmark it again. So next one uh, we're going to look at is using explain. Using explain isn't actually a performance improvement in itself. But what it allows you to do is break down exactly what a query is doing, uh, what we refer to as the execution plan. So explain will show you which indexes can be used for any given query, and then which index MySQL actually decided to use. It will tell you if there was a covering index. It will tell you how many rows had to be scanned. It will show you lots of other overheads. So if it had to use a file sort or use a memory table, whatever else, and various other operations that the query had to do to be able to process. Um, so looking at this, you can look at kind of where the weaknesses in your queries are and use these things um, in, association in association with the other ideas that we're talking about to improve the performance of those queries. So here's an example. Um, using explain is as simple as sticking the word explain in front of your query. So it's probably a little bit small, and I do apologize, but um, I had a, a query here, select u.star, a.address1, a.address2, a.postcode from users, blah, 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 blah. And all I've done is stick explain at the front of it, and you get this execution plan back from MySQL. So what it does is it gives you a row for each table within your query. Um, so you see I've got one for the U table, which is the users table, and one for the A table, which is the address table. It's saying that on the user table, there are actually no keys that I can use, and on the address table, there's only the primary key. Um, it's telling me how many rows it's had to look up. So in this example, because I've got no indexes, um, it had to scan through 25,065 rows to find um, the, the person that I wanted. Um, that's obviously ridiculously inefficient, um, and you know, ev you know, it's obviously something that you would need to fix straight away. So we're going to add a couple of indexes. We've added an index on postcode on the address table, and then we've added an index on the address ID on the user table. <coughs> and sure enough, then it's going. Oh look, I've got lots of lots of, lots of primary uh, keys I can use now. I've got the primary or the postcode. I've got the address ID. Uh, and you can see at the end there, now it's only having to look up 15 rows to find the matches it needs. So instantly, vastly, vastly more efficient. Just from running that one explain query, going, right, stick to indexes on it, happy days. Um, here's another slightly more complicated example. Um, so again, we're using um, another query, very, very similar query. Um, and again, we're explaining it. And you notice here that in the extra column on the end here, we've got using index condition, using temporary, using file sort. Um, and what that's effectively saying is it is using the index um, for the where clause, but it can't return all the columns it needs from that index. So in other words, it's not a covering index. It's using a temporary table, and it can't sort on an index, so it's having to use a file-based sort as well. Um, so again, we've actually then created this covering index that we were talking about. Um, so we're creating an index on address ID, name, and email. And you see now that on this second row here, it's now saying using index. So that's telling us that it's using a covering index, um, which again, as we said before, reduces the amount of disk reads you have to do. Certainly if it can store that index in memory, it can pull those 
uh, column straight from memory. Um, so the next one to do is actually separating data and logic. So this is kind of MySQL and also PHP at the same time. Um, we've, all, you know, we've all seen cases and we've all probably built queries where all the filtering is put into MySQL. I mean, that's the database engine. Why wouldn't you do that? Um, however, there are plenty of cases where actually doing the filtering in PHP would be more efficient. Um, so allow the MySQL to do some basic filtering to reduce the result set, but then use PHP to filter out the edge cases that you don't need. Um, it also means that you're releasing the MySQL connection that much earlier because it's got less work to do. So another query, another thread that's waiting for a MySQL connection can pick up a connection that much quicker. Who recognizes this query? Yeah, that's a few of you. What this query is, it's the standard way for calculating which points sit within a fixed distance, fixed radius, I should say, from a certain point. It's the great circle formula. Um, it's often used if you've got store locators and you want, you know, all, well, in this instance, all hotels within 25 miles of a given query. Um, we can do it in MySQL. That is the query in MySQL. And as I said, it'll return the hotels and that's fine. However, when we run that um, on, a, again, a test table I generated that had 70,000 records, I think, um, it's taking 0 0.4, uh, 0 0.04 seconds fairly consistently, and it's returning 1,164 rows. So is there a way that we can improve that by moving the filtering into PHP? Um, so in this instance, what we're doing, again, there's an awful lot of code there, but what we're effectively doing is returning a bounding box so if you imagine you've got a square that the circle fits within to kind of filter down the results but in a really simple way. So we're literally just saying where lat is between this and this and where long is between this and this. Um, and then we're passing that result set down to PHP to pare down the ones that are in the corners that actually aren't in the circle that we need. Um, I did borrow the distance AB function because it was quicker than writing one. Um, but you know, it's effectively doing exactly what we were doing in MySQL. The calculation, the formula is exactly the same. We've not changed the logic. The results you get back will be exactly the same. We've just passed the actual job of doing that filtering into the PHP. And look at the difference. You know, this is practically twice as fast. You know, you've gone from you know, 0 0.04 to 0 0.01 to 0 0.02. Um, that's obviously, you know, if you've got a store located that, again, is being used by 50,000 users, that difference is going to be massive, just from actually probably writing it in the language you're more comfortable with. Um, so if you've got a lot of data, it's being used, you know, that's definitely something that you guys should be looking at. That's just one example of splitting, splitting the filtering logic. It can also be useful for pagination, particularly if you're using NODB. Um, I'm going to come on to kind of the different storage engines a little bit later anyway. But in an ODB, um, the counting of the number of rows in a table is actually quite expensive because unlike my ISAM, which keeps a metadata record of how many rows are in the DB, comments, all that sort of stuff, that doesn't exist in Inno. It has to go and physically get the number of rows. Um, so comparatively, it's quite expensive. So it may well be, certainly if you've got an awful lot of data, that actually returning the data to PHP and then using array trunk or whatever else to do the pagination on your application side is quicker. Benchmark it. Some instances it won't be quicker. Don't bother doing it. Some instances it will be quicker. As yeah, fully you know, just benchmark, test, make changes, test again, make more changes, test again. I really can't specify that enough. Query caching is something else that we can do. Um, you guys have probably all seen graphs like this before. Um, this is a, a tool called Munin. It's not just for monitoring MySQL. It monitors you know, disk space, CPU load, um, hard disk um, throughput. Really worth using, but that's kind of irrelevant. Um, query cache won't improve performance on an individual query. That's not what it does. It won't instantly speed up your query the first time you run it. That's not what query cache does. What query caching is, is it's a cache that when you, write, it, when you run a select query and it returns that result set, it then stores the result of the select in memory um, so that the next time that same query is run, it doesn't have to go and fetch it from the, file, the files again. It literally goes, oh, I've already got a cache of this result. There you go, Merry Christmas. Um, it's most effective when you've got a high contention, re, a high contention read heavy site. 
So like a blog, a CMS, that sort of thing. But it is still beneficial on sites that do a lot of writing. The only downside is that each time you do a write that affects the result of that query cache, it then has to invalidate that cache, so the next time the query comes in, it has to go and fetch, you know, do the whole query again. But it, you know, even if you've got, you know, a query might run 20 times before it's invalidated, that's still going to be more beneficial than having to go and run the query 20 times um, from the file system. So to configure the query cache, it's really simple in my.conf for whatever your, your MySQL config file is. You turn query caching on with query cache type equals one. You set the size um, to whatever memory you've got available. So if you can give it, you know, if you can give it 20, 20 meg, great. If you've got a gig to spare and you've got a lot of queries going through, give it a gig. You know, give it whatever memory you can do. You can always monitor its usage and pair that back if you find it's never using the memory, or if you find actually it's having to prune a lot of queries. In other words, it can't fit all the queries in the, in, in the cache, then you can increase the memory size as well. So as I said, so I've set those configs, restarted my SQL, and you can see that it's saying, right, my query cache limit, uh, my query cache size, sorry, is the size I specified, that it's turned on, that's all working. And then likewise, you can then come and look at the status, so you can see how much memory it's got, um, how many hits, in other words, how many times have I asked MySQL to give me a query result where it has been able to pull it from the cache, how many queries have been inserted into the cache, how many times we've had to prune it because we've run out of memory. In other words, if I've tried to insert a result set into the cache and there isn't enough disk, it will then, uh, isn't enough memory, it will then bin the oldest entry in the cache. If it's doing that a lot, then you know you probably need to give it more memory. Um, how many queries can't be cached? In this case, one, because you can't cache a show variable. Uh, query. How many queries are in the cache? None, because I've only just set it up, and the blocks, which doesn't really matter. So here's an example. This is that uh, great circle query again. And you see the first time, again, it returned 1,164 results, and it took 0 0.05 seconds. Once you've run that query, that is then cached. That is stored in the query cache. If you ran the show status again, you would see that there is one query in the cache. So the second time we run it, look, naught seconds, because it's already got the result, it's in memory, it's literally just gone, there you go, have a nice day, I'm gonna go to sleep. Um, and look, if you look at the query cache again, you see that we've had one hit, yay. Um, and it's returned it, so it's found the query cache, and it's returned that, so it's not taking up any time at all. I said I'd come back to storage engines, um, so choosing the right storage engine. I was, I was getting a bit desperate for imagery at this point. Um, you might be able to guess, but why not? So, NODB versus MySAM. There are other storage engines available, as the BBC would say, um, but in 90% of cases, you're probably using one of the two. So, I'm gonna stick to those. Obviously, if you're using Pocona, then the storage engines are different, um, but that's outside the scope of this particular talk. So, as another point to note, I would generally advise using InnoDB in most cases. Um, if you're unsure which one you should use, then use InnoDB. Um, but there are times where MySAM is the right choice. As a general rule, MySAM is faster for doing read operations. So if you've got a, a app that's very, very rarely written to, but you're reading hundreds of thousands of times, then that's probably the right choice. Um, and then, likewise, InnoDB is better for writes-heavy applications. However, it's not only about performance when you're talking about storage engines. If you're looking for ACID, or near ACID compliance, it's not quite ACID compliant, um, but if you're looking for near ACID compliance, um, or you're looking for foreign key constraints, then you have to use InnoDB, you don't have a choice. Um, likewise, in fact, if you've got a slightly older version of MySQL, so anything less than 5.6, and you need to have a full text index, then you have to use MySAM because conversely, you know, DB didn't support that. Again, your best bet is to benchmark, try them both out, and have a look at that. So that's exactly what I did. So it's the same user table as before. Again, very similar, uh, very similar query, just looking up an email address, and you can see when I did it using um, the InnoDB storage engine, it's taking 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.3. When we switched over to using the MySAM storage engine, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. So again, it's not a massive difference, but it was only 100 queries on a 25,000 row table. Um, but there was 
enough of a difference, even at that level, that if you have got an incredibly right heavy application, you probably should take a look at it. Use a slow query log. Again, still getting desperate for imagery. If anyone wants to suggest any better imagery for the next time I give this talk, then you know, do hit me up on Twitter. Um, it's a tortoise or a turtle, I don't know, one of the two. Slow query log. In most applications, you will find the same pattern occurs. Most of your queries are absolutely fine, they run perfectly well, happy days. But you might have one or two that perform like a dog. Uh, and the problem is with that, you've got one or two queries that are slow. Certainly if they're queries that are used often, it then adds extra load to the, to the server. It has an impact on everything else. Those queries are slow. People start moaning, oh, why is the application so slow? Oh, do we need a big server? All that stuff, it's not much fun for anyone. By logging the slow queries, we can identify the queries that are slow, and then we can work on ways to improve the performance. It basically gives us a big target of these are the things you need to be hitting. The definition of a slow query does depend on the application and the context, but you know most people would agree that a query that takes three quarters of a second is slow. Um, the problem with this was that until not that long ago, MySQL always only allowed second resolution of slow queries. So when you configure your slow query log, you either had to say my zero is my slow query time, in which case it logged everything, or one second is my slow query, but then it, you know, a 0.9 second query, which is still slow, wouldn't get logged. Um, Pocona fixed it a long time before MySQL did. Why it took so long for MySQL to fix it, I can only say because of Oracle. Um, but they did finally fix it in 5.1.21. So here's an example of using slow query log. Again, back in trustymy.conf. Um, slow query log one turns it on. Where do you want to write the slow queries to? Var log slow query log, for sake of example, and what the long what a slow query consists of. So I've cho chosen 0.1 seconds. Um, so basically, what that's saying is any any query that takes longer than 0.1 seconds is going to be put into the log. Um, so again, we'll come back to the, the great circle theory because it is quite slow. Um, this time, I gave it some weird join. Basically, I'm, I made this query just horrible, and I put a stupid join in that makes no sense, but it made it run terribly. Look, 1.9 seconds. <laughs> um, if you then go and have a look at the slow query log, you can see here that it's saying, um, the second one down, sorry, that here's the query. This is how many rows were sent. It had to look at 495,000 rows, uh, which is pretty impressive. And how long the query time was, uh, and the lock time, and everything else. So instantly, that's telling you, look, this, this query is one that you need to look at because it's shit. Um, what, as I said, the definition of a slow query is dependent on context. If you've got a reporting function that takes 20 seconds to run, but it's only been run, run once a day in the background at 10 at night, does that really matter? No. On the other hand, if you've got a query that's taking half a second or maybe even less, maybe a quarter of a second or a tenth of a second, but that query is being run every single second of the day, then that probably is something that you need to take a look at. Um, so review your slow query logs regularly. Use um, a tool that allows you to break it down. So there is one that comes with MySQL, which is MySQL Dump Slow, really imaginatively named. Um, and what it does is it gives you a breakdown of the queries that are showing up in the slow query log most. So if you've got one that's showing up 100 times, when you put the log through MySQL dump slow, it will be that query that comes out at the top. So you know that's the first one you need to pay attention to. If you've got one that is only being run once, you know, you'll probably get to it at some point, but it doesn't really matter. Um, there are other tools as well. Um, I mentioned Pocona a few times because I am a fan of Pocona. Um, and the Pocona toolkit does have a very good log parser as well. But for most instances, to be honest, the MySQL dump slow um, works perfectly well. I've kind of made a joke about how I was struggling for imagery. No, no more so than on this next slide. So there is an advertising opportunity here. If anyone wants to advertise on my presentation for a re very reasonable price, then let me know. <laughs> Understanding data types. So there's lots of obviously data types in MySQL and they're all used for different things. You know, you've got int, small int, medium, big int. 
uh, tiny, and, you know, all sorts of uh, data types. And a lot of the times you kind of look at them and go, well, kind of what's the difference? Um, but they are all stored and handled very, very differently. Um, so as a general rule, as it says there, numeric data types tend to be quicker than string text-based data types. Kind of makes sense. You know, computers use numbers internally. Converting stuff from a string to a number to then do an operation on it, then convert it back to a string, you know, it's going to be a, that much more work. Um, the particular problem tends to be the blob and the text columns. The reason for that is the way MySQL stores those um, is it actually stores them in separate files. So you've got your database with um, all, your, all your kind of main data in it, your database on disk with all your main rows in it. And then there's a second file that it has all the blobs and the text, um, the long text and that sort of thing in. And then so if you're doing a query that's using both, it has to read all the DB rows and it has to go and fetch that and then join it all together and then return the row. And, you know, it's, that's why it becomes very inefficient. It also means it has to use a temporary table because before it can do any sorting, um, where's, whatever else, it has to put it all together into a table that it can work on. Um, so it's using a lot of disk throughput. It's using a lot more processor than it needs to. And that, as such, it is inefficient. There is a performance penalty there. So what should you do about it? If you don't need to use a text, then don't. If you can use, you know, if, if you're using a text field for an email address, then don't use a 255 varchar or whatever else. Sometimes you have to, you know, if you've got a bio, you've got a file that's stored in the DB, you haven't got a choice. You have to use those text, but avoid it when you can. If you do have to use them, the best thing I can say is actually store them in a different DB table. So if you imagine if you have like users and then a user meta table, your kind of core data that you're accessing frequently your username, your, your password, name, email address, those sorts of things store in your user table, and then have a separate user underscore meta table or whatever you want to call it that references, you know, user ID, bio, profile picture, whatever else, store all that away, and then only query that when you absolutely have to. There's a few people nodding here, so I think that's probably been discussed in various offices around the UK already, but good. Um, Again, use, use the right data type for the size. So many times have I seen and done um, built tables with an index, an ID, a primary key, and I've used the big int data type. I don't do it now because are you really going to have a database table with 4,294,967,295 records? I would put good money on no. Um, if you do, then obviously use a big int or an unsigned int, depending on kind of where, how many records you have got. But if you don't need that number of records, then go and use int. Or if it's like a, a, a small lookup table and you're only going to have 50, use tiny int. Tiny int allows you to go up to 127 if it's signed or 256 if it's unsigned. You really should know that. Um, so if you know you've only got a few things you're going to ever look at, if, like a user, a user type table. So if you've got admin, user, guest, don't give it a big int, please. <laughs> um, so here's an example. Um, really ugly user table. So we've got a big int for ID. We've got a text for bio. We've got two big ints for user level ID and address ID. Um, and I think I just literally did a select star for this one. Um, ran it through the test, it's taking 0.12 seconds, 0.26, 0.14. Um, we then change it, so we're using an int for the ID. Again, that probably could be small. I probably could get away with a mid-int or a small int, but we've left it as int for this example. Drop the bio table, uh, the bio field, because we don't need it, um, and made the other IDs small ints. Run it again, and even on you know, a fairly small data set, um, it's come down to 0 0.10, 0 0.12, 0 0.11. So again, a lot more consistent. Um, you know, the difference between the minimum and the maximum is 0 0.02 compared to, you know, one-tenth of a second, um, which is a big difference. And it has made it slightly quicker as well. So again, have a look through your, your DB schemas. You know, if you've got 100 users in a DB, it's not going to make much difference. But if you've got 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 records, it could actually have more of a difference than I think you know, people appreciate. Um, so, kind of coming towards the end of it, 
As I mentioned at the beginning, there isn't a one-size-fits-all. You can't just go and put all of these on there and assume your performance is going to be awesome, because it probably won't. Um, some of these approaches will work better than others in certain situations. Um, so, as I've said it four or five times, I'm going to say it again, benchmark. Take measurements before you make any changes, otherwise you don't know if your changes have made a difference or not. Make the changes on your test platform, then benchmark again. If it has improved, happy days. If it hasn't, fine, go back, try something else. Um, and consider scale. You, know, you might say that an improvement of a tenth of a second on a query isn't an awful lot. But if you're running that query every second, then the, over a course of a day, it's the equivalent to actually 2.4 hours, which I think we'd all agree is a pretty big saving. So that's about it. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. If you have any questions, then we've got some time for that. Otherwise, if you leave me some feedback, this is the first talk I've done on this sort of scale. I've done kind of user groups and local things before, so really would appreciate the feedback. The slides are available in the green QR code, and we're recruiting. Thank you very much. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, two questions, actually. First one is about indexes, okay. um, about rebuilding them. Is okay. that something that needs to be done? How regular? Um, is something that needs to be done? No. On, a, on the whole, the only reason you would need to rebuild indexes is if you're regularly deleting records or, or updating records, which is effectively a delete and an insert. If you're adding new records, it doesn't make that much of a difference. If you're deleting records, or I said you're doing lots and lots of updates, then yes, you probably would do it. I wouldn't do it as part of your daily process, but maybe have a, a cron job that goes through and cleans stuff up on a Sunday night when no one's accessing the application. Um, again, it's kind of testing what works in your environment. It, you know, if you do it manually once and actually you're getting no improvement from it, then you don't need to do it again. If actually you go, shit, we've saved you know, 0.3 seconds on a query, then it's probably something that's worth doing more regularly in future. Cool, and yeah, just quickly, if say you had a CMS where people, a call center people could search for customer data, mm -hmm. and there was actually maybe 10 columns they could search by, yeah. so the entire address, account number, email address, something like that, obviously you wouldn't index every single row in say the address table. Um, what kind of numbers can you get away with? Could you index like half a table, or is that getting <laughs> ridiculous already? Um, that's a really good question, actually. I'm going to struggle to answer, I think. Damn it. Uh, um, again, I guess it's a, a case of you wouldn't necessarily, as you said, index, having an index on every column, certainly if there's lots and lots of writes going in as well, which there probably would be for that sort of situation, is going to be horrible. Um, what you could potentially do as an alternative, I'm trying to think of alternatives now. Uh, <laughs> anyone else? Um, is I would suggest analyzing it. So what you know, I know they can search from every column, but which ones are the ones they do most often? You know, if for example, take the address column. If actually most people know their custom number or they know their name, and they're only searching on the address column once in every five thousand uses then you're pretty safe with not indexing the address column, and that one time in 5,000 they use it, well, it's going to be a bit slow. Um, you know, if, on the other hand, like the customer number, because most customers know their number, um, again, I don't know about your particular use case, but if that's the case, then you definitely want to be putting the index on there. The other thing is if they often search by groups, you can have a multi-columned index. So if a lot of people are using the customer number and the postcode, then you can have an index that covers both of those. The thing to be careful of with that is if you have a column that, if you have an index that is customer number first and then postcode, if you've got a query that's looking up on customer number, it can use it. If you've got a query that's using both the customer number and the postcode, it can use it. But if it's only looking up on the postcode, then it can't because it hasn't filtered by the customer number first. Also, just to note, your query should also match the order of your index as well if you're using dual keys. It will, it, will, the op, it will switch them around, but yeah, yeah it, it probably should. should. There are certainly older versions have trouble with it yeah. anyway. Um, yeah. All right, one trick we used to use with my ISAM tables is um, to make sure the rows were fixed width. Uh, we've subsequently moved to 
mostly in ODB, uh, so we don't need to use it as much, but is that still effective? Um, I noticed you didn't mention that when you're talking about my ISA. To be honest, I mean, I have done tests on it a long time ago. The reason I don't mention it is because I don't use fixed width columns as a rule, because from tests that I've done previously, the gains were negligible, certainly compared to some of the other things you can do instead. Again, I mean, the only thing to say with all these things is benchmark it. Um, as I said, you know, when I've done benchmarks in the past, I found the gains you know, to be negligible, so it, it wasn't worth it for, you know, for, for doing its sake. Um, but in, again, in a particular use case, if you try it, you know, build a test table with your data, run the query a thousand times, whatever, make it a fixed width column. If it makes a substantial difference, um, rebuild the table, which you've changed the con uh, data types, obviously. If it then makes a substantial difference, then you're probably onto a winner. If, as I would suspect, in 99% of cases it doesn't, then, you know, no harm done. So one next door. Hello? Hello. Oh, geez, hi. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what would you suggest to improve uh, full text index rebuilding and uh, in massive reinserts and updating of full text indexes? Um. Um, to be honest, that's where I would turn to replication. Um, it's a bit of a cop out answer, but what I, I don't know because it was a little bit quiet in here. But what, what he was saying is, if you've got full text, full text indexes, they can be quite problematic to rebuild for obvious reasons, certainly on really big tables. That's where I would look at um, some form of replication where perhaps you've got a right table, um, uh, sorry, a right DB and then a read DB that are both configured differently. Um, so you can basically be doing the re-index re re or the rebuild of the index on one and query the other. And then once that's done, you swap ownership onto the back to your primary database if you like, and then you can re-index the second one. Okay. Oh, there's one more hand. I was expecting this. I was hoping for like one, one question and I could go and get drunk. <laughs> uh, just curious, uh, stored procedures or anything like that? Uh, performance gains with those? Yeah, I mean, stored procedures, it's one of those things that we don't use them ha half as much as we should do in PHP. I don't know why. Yeah, you go and look at um, you know, .NET um, applications and they consistently use stored procedures. Um, Again, to be honest, stored procedures isn't something that I've actually used an awful lot of. There are, I know there are performance gains in doing it, um, but I wouldn't be able to quantify them. Anyone over on your side, Aaron? No, we're all good here. Oh, no, one more. One more. <laughs> Thank you for the talk and sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> uh, from your experience, what's the impact on performance when using uh, foreign keys? It, impact on performance when using foreign keys? Um, in, in terms of kind of them being slower or? I, I guess, it, you know, again, it's one of those things where actually my view is, uh, you know, foreign keys are a brilliant idea. If anyone hasn't used foreign keys, what that basically means is when you try and um, do an insert or an update, whatever else, if you've got a foreign key constraint set, then it checks against the other table that the foreign key is set against that you've got valid matching records. So um, at the, the company where I work at the moment, we do some work with <coughs> Magento, um, which, as you know, is lots of uses lots of foreign keys. Um, and what it will do is if you try and insert uh, an order, and you're saying the, Kate, the basket ID is 50, it will manually go and check that there is a basket ID, uh, a basket with an ID of 50 in the basket table. Very, very simplified example, but it is. Um, in most cases, again, the performance impact isn't that great. Um, you know, it is a bit of extra, extra processing, um, but if you've got 10,000 rows, and certainly, bear in mind, as we said, you, you know, your foreign key will have its index anyway. So it is using the index to do that check. It's not having to do a, a full table search or anything like that. Um, it's not going to be massive. If you've got incredibly large tables, and certainly if it depends on how important that data consistency is. If actually someone inserts one without a basket ID and it then just goes, oh, well, it's not really in order, and it doesn't matter, 
then if you've got lots and lots of records, you know, you're talking about you know, millions of records probably for this to have an impact, then again, you might look at putting that into PHP in the same way as we did with the, the great circle stuff. Um, but in most cases, you know, it doesn't have a massive knock-on effect. Any more on your side? <laughs>